So Christians have the Bible, Jews have the Tanakh, Muslims have the Quran, Aristotelians have the books of Aristotle, Platonists have the books of Plato. What do Buddhists have? So I'm Doug Smith, I'm study director at the Secular Buddhist Association, that's secularbuddhism.org. And if you're interested in trying to help foment a wiser, a kinder, a less stressed out world, consider subscribing to Doug Secular Dharma and one of these buttons or badges around here. Uh, we'd love to have you. So today we're trying to discuss uh, the texts of Buddhism. What are they? What are the key texts? Here I'm going to be discussing the texts of early Buddhism in particular, the foundational texts if you like. And at the end of this I'll try to provide uh, a book which some of you will have seen before. It's a good introduction to what amounts to a very, very large selection of books. What I'm going to be discussing here is really the origins of Buddhism in a textual sense. Pretty much everything I say here is uh, disputed to some extent by somebody. So what I'm going to be talking about here is based on scholarship from particular scholars who have focused on this area of Buddhism in particular, early, early Buddhism. So to begin with, uh, the Buddha taught orally. Uh, nothing was written down during his lifetime. For all we know, uh, he and his followers were illiterate. Uh, they would have spoken uh, a language today which is called, um, which we term Magadhi Prakrit. That is, it's from the area of uh, India called Magadha. And it's a Prakrit, which means it's a dialect of Sanskrit. Now, Pali itself, the language in which these early texts were written, later on is itself a Prakrit, it's a dialect of Sanskrit, which would have been similar to Magadhi Prakrit, but not identical. And during the Buddha's lifetime, many of his teachings would have been memorized. His, some of his earlier teachings were in verse form, and so that would have been very easy to memorize. And we do have evidence from the texts of uh, monks memorizing these, uh, these oral poems and then reciting them to one another and uh, having to be taught in them. So they might have had a question about a particular uh, section of a poem and they would have asked somebody and, and got an answer. And this kind of memorization would have gone on during the Buddha's lifetime. Uh, in particular, after the death of the head of Jainism at the time, which was a, a competing philosophy or religion, after he died, there was uh, a huge fight within the Jain Sangha and a lot of acrimony because different people had different recollections of what had been taught. And this happened during the Buddha's lifetime, so there's some belief that if that may have been a spur to him to, to, to get his monks more interested in memorizing the teachings, so that after his death there wouldn't be the same kind of problem. Now after uh, the Buddha did pass away, it's traditionally believed that around three months later there was what's called the First Council, where a number of monks got together and discussed these issues and came up with basically a package of teachings that they believed were authentic. This would have been somewhere around 400 BCE, and there would have been, these teachings would have been organized into roughly two or three different baskets or groups. The first would have been the suttas, that would have been the actual teachings of the Buddha himself and certain of his uh, key disciples. The second would have been uh, the Vinaya, that is uh, the sort of the rules uh, of monastic life and, uh, and their history. And there may have been a third as well called the Matikas or mnemonic lists, that is lists of memorization that would have helped monks to understand the general structure of the Dhamma uh, without having to remember all of the spe specific suttas. Later on, those matikas probably became uh, the Abhidharma, which is the third major basket of early Buddhist teachings. And the Abhidharma is sort of uh, a more structured, more formalized kind of philosophical treatment of the teaching in, in uh, rather dry but very precise kind of categories. If we take those three baskets today, the suttas, the vinaya, and the Abhidharma, that runs to 50 or 55 volumes in Pali, so it's a very large group of information. So to get some more specific uh, about, uh, let's start with the suttas, because it's probably the most important to us, uh, to, lay to lay students. Uh, the word sutta traditionally has been linked to the word sutra in, in Sanskrit, and the word sutra is uh, related etymologically to the, word, to the word suture in English. It means a thread. Sanskrit and Pali are both Indo-European languages, so there actually are a lot of uh, similarities if we look carefully. Uh, the word sutra in, in Brahmanic teaching was basically uh, 
a verse poem that would have been uh, memorized by a student and recited to a teacher. But um, some contemporary scholars, including uh, Rupert Gethin and uh, Richard Gombrich, believe that in fact the word may, may stem from uh, sukta, which means uh, well-spoken. Uh, so these were the, uh, the parts of the memorization, the, the memorized material that was spoken by the Buddha or his key disciples properly. And these were, these were separated into different groups or nikayas and given, you know, based on certain similarities. So there were, for instance, there were the middle length teachings uh, that were probably given to one group of, of monastics to recite and memorize. There were the long discourses that were given to another group of monastics. There were the discourses that were related based on topic to a third group. Uh, there were the sutras uh, organized by number that were given to a fourth group. And then there was a fifth basket of sort of miscellaneous material. And to give you an idea, uh, probably the most famous is the Majjhima Nikai, the middle length. That's what it looks like in, in an English translation. Um, the longer discourses, the the Diganikaya looks like this. This is the numerical discourses, a thicker book with lots of footnotes. Connected discourses, uh, another large book. And then the miscellaneous uh, texts, which include such famous volumes as the Dhammapada, uh, the Sutta Nipata, very early texts, most of them. Uh, very, very famous questions of King Melinda in two volumes. And various other, I have a few of them here. Um, this is only a small selection. There are many others in the miscellaneous texts. So that gives you an idea of the, of the, the scope of just uh, the basket of, of teachings that stem more or less from the Buddha's lifetime. Of course, not all of them do. Uh, many of them are from later. But all that we have of the Buddha's uh, speech is probably somewhere in here. Now, as I say, these were probably given to different uh, groups of monastics to recite and memorize. And that would have been, one, one expects, that would have been for a reason. That way, you weren't reliant on one monk to try to, mem to memorize them all, which would have, been ex would have been exceedingly difficult. It's said that there are some monastics today who have been able to memorize all of it. I have no reason to disbelieve that. But in any way, that would have been very difficult. Also, by having this memorization split into groups, what you're allowing for is cross-checking. Because if then if any question came up about a specific point of dispute in the Dharma, monastics could have, uh, could have cross-checked one another. If one group said that some particular teaching was correct, there would have been three or four other groups who would have had similar teachings in their own basket who could have checked that. Uh, that's not to say that these, that these books are identical by any means. They all complete, contain uh, very different suttas, but there's enough overlap between them that they could have been cross-checked in that fashion to an extent. Now the Vinaya is another group of texts. I don't have uh, copies of the Vinaya here. Richard Gombrich, who's probably one of the best known um, scholars of, of early Buddhism, uh, puts the Vinaya to around 350 BCE, so that would have been 50 years after the Buddha's death, that it would have been compiled into something like its final form, at least, you know, in a, in a form that we might recognize. The last of these baskets is the Abhidhamma or Abhidharma, and again, that's a number of very large books. Um, this is a very good uh, comprehensive manual of the Abhidhamma, which is, which is uh, something by, out by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, which gives a, a general overview of the Abhidharma. The Abhidharma texts tend to be very dry. The idea is that in the suttas, in the, which are basically oral dialogues of one kind or another, the Buddhist philosophy was distributed in various ways. And so if you want a good picture, an overall picture of the philosophy, it's very difficult to get that from the suttas because you have to read an awful lot of them and, and remember them and, and be able to sort of cross-correlate them in your mind. If you can think of a teacher who taught over, you know, a 35-year career, 40-year career, and if his students were memorized memorizing what he said in any, any given day, trying to put that all together and correlate it is very difficult. And that was really the job uh, of the Abhidharma. And the Abhidharma was probably begun by the Buddha's chief disciple Sariputta within his lifetime. Uh, again, um, I talked about how uh, there was this issue with the Jains and how they, they had this conflict after one of their leaders died. That would have been a spur to try to correlate things and get more of a a detailed understanding of what exactly the Buddha Dharma was, but also Sariputta seems to have been somebody who was particularly philosophically sophisticated and particularly interested in clarity and concision. And so uh, there are a number of his own dialogues within the suttas, and one gets that feeling of him as somebody who was very interested in precision. The Abhidhamma probably began within the Buddha's lifetime. Again, so some of the suttas have a very Abhidhamma-type flavor to them. It became scholasticized later on, well after the Buddha's death. So everything I've been discussing until now was oral. Uh, now, all this material, it was believed, was brought to Sri Lanka in the third century BCE by 
the son of Ashoka. Ashoka was uh, the first great Buddhist monarch over most of uh, present-day India, and he had a great deal of power and influence, and was responsible for uh, bringing Buddhism to a much wider group of people. And it's believed that the material remained in oral form until uh, roughly the first century BCE, when either due to a famine or due to some kind of natural disasters of some kind, the monks who were doing the memorization were beginning to die out. And there was some real fear of losing uh, access to the Dharma within uh, Sri Lanka. And so the decision was made to write it down. And it was written down in Pali, and so it's generally believed um, by scholars such as Rupert Gethin that the Pali Canon is, the, is likely to be the oldest uh, tradition within Buddhism, which is certainly not to say that everything in the Pali Canon goes back to the origins of Buddhism. Later on, the material was brought to China and there was an intensive translation campaign roughly from the 2nd to the 10th centuries of the Common Era in China. And again, uh, Rupert Gethin believes that the, um, the Pali Canon itself was probably translated into Chinese. Uh, it's known as the Agamas in Chinese, roughly at the end of the 4th century uh, of the Common Era. So, you know, nearly, well, 800 years after the Buddha died, uh, probably, say, five centuries after it was written down in Sri Lanka. But these uh, two groups of texts, the Pali Canon and the Chinese Agamas, are probably our earliest two uh, groups of texts, and they can be cross-checked and correlated. And a lot of that work is being done now by uh, scholars who are proficient in both uh, the Chinese of the Agamas and the Pali of the Canon. Uh, one of the greatest of these is uh, the Buddhist monk uh, Analio. And what they've found so far is that there um, is no significant difference in teachings between the Agamas and the Pali Canon. There is, however, there are, however, great differences in the organizations of the texts, which leads us to believe that uh, a lot of the organizational features of the texts that we see before us today came later on. The texts were probably preserved orally in a more haphazard fashion, piecemeal, and then organized more as time went on, as the centuries went on. And so that in Chinese we see sort of one group of these that's basically the texts have been cobbled together in one group, in one fashion and in Pali in another, but that basically they're, they're compiled out of the same uh, original material, or at least very similar original material. Now later on we get uh, the Mahayana texts, which I won't be discussing here. Many of them, like this Hartz Sutra or the Diamond Sutra came from uh, a later tradition. Uh, these were texts that were written later and put in the mouth of the Buddha. That's not entirely alien to the, to the old tradition. It's almost certainly the case that many of the texts that are preserved now in the Pali Canon were written after the Buddha's lifetime and put in his mouth. And the Buddha did say in one very famous text that basically uh, the Dharma was anything that was well spoken, that was well put, that was true. And so in many of the people of the later tradition, they would have composed texts completely anew, but believed that they were within the spirit of the Buddha's teachings. And so in order to give them an additional seriousness within the tradition, uh, also also put them in the Buddha's mouth. Much of these compositions may also have come out of certain kinds of meditative insight, and so the people uh, doing the composing may have felt that themselves, they themselves were not personally responsible for these texts. Nevertheless, if we are going to talk about a Buddhist canon in the same way that we talk about the, the Gospels of Christianity, you know, we can say in rough, in rough sense that the, the Nikayas play that role within Buddhism. Uh, they're, uh, reviewed in all traditions of Buddhism. They're spoken of highly in all traditions of Buddhism. They're considered the word of the Buddha in, in all traditions of Buddhism. But they shouldn't be considered uh, the word of God in the same sense that uh, religious texts in, let's say, Western religions are considered uh, infallible. Within Buddhism, these are considered uh, humanly created texts. It's not unusual to have people talk about errors within them. And to myself, the, the texts that they, most, uh, rep uh, that they most resemble are the dialogues that one finds in, in pre-Socratics, Socrates, and Plato. The people that come across in them are real people. Many of the subjects that come across in them are subjects of everyday life. Many of the dialogues and arguments come across as being uh, dialogues and arguments between real people, even if they've perhaps been tailored uh, after the fact to make the Buddha look uh, particularly good and to make his opponents look bad. And nevertheless, one gets the feeling of a real argument at the, at the heart there. Clearly, there's too much here to read by, for any uh, person except somebody who's interested in the text for their own sake. And many of you, I'm sure, are not. 
If you want a general introduction, uh, this is a very good one. It's one I've recommended before. It's a uh, translation by uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, who did most of the translations of the other texts into English. Uh, it's called In the Buddha's Words, and it gives uh, a, a selection of texts that gives a representative sample of what sort of goes on in those kinds of texts without having to, to go through all of them. And he organizes them by theme, so uh, it makes it easy to delve into a particular theme that interests you. What we're trying to do is to help create a world that is wiser, that's kinder, and that's less stressed out. And, you know, look, reading books is not really going to do that for us. Uh, we have to put the stuff into, into practice. But nevertheless, these practices do come from particular texts. They come from an oral tradition over hundreds of years that was then written down and preserved in, in, in texts that we have today, in, in translation for most of us. And so study of these texts can be part of, uh, of your practice if that's what interests you. And even if it doesn't interest you, I think at least knowing what those texts are, where they come from, so that maybe in the future, if, some, if you have some question, you can go to them. There are also great online uh, repositories of these texts, uh, which I'll include in the section down below. But just so you know, suttacentral.com is great. Um, I think it's .com. I'll, I'll check and make sure. Uh, and uh, Access to Insight is another one uh, where they have some very good uh, translations of these texts. So if you're new to the channel, thanks thanks so much for being here. And if you're coming back again, I'm really glad, glad to see you back. I hope this is useful. Any questions or comments you have, uh, feel free to leave them uh, down below. Always love to read those. And again, thanks so much for being here. I will catch you on the next one.